All right, so this is Walter Brown, guys. Welcome. Uh, beginning of The Great Gatsby. So Fitzgerald needs to do some work on the person he has determined will be the teller of the tale. All right, so we get The Great Gatsby from one perspective. We get it from Nick Carraway. And he has to establish what is called ethos, right? E-T-H-O-S. He has to be a reliable narrator. We have to believe in what he's telling us in order for us to believe in such a crazy, crazy tale. Fitzgerald will later in the novel change the perspective briefly where it's Jordan giving us some background. But that's the only time it changes perspective. And Nick will let us know that, you know, this is what Jordan told me one summer night. And because we need to know some background between, you know, Daisy and Jordan. But that's, we're getting ahead of our time. We're getting ahead of ourselves. So let's take a look at just the opening pages of chapter one. Very famous opening. In my younger and more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've been turning over in my mind ever since. So he's establishing I was vulnerable when I was young, all right, revealing some. Now, listen, I, you know, I was uh, sensitive. I was vulnerable to, you know, perhaps bullies or people who were, you know, strong or people like Gatsby, all right? And he says, the father, whenever you feel like criticizing anyone, he told me, just remember that all the people in this world haven't had the advantages that you've had. This will become ironic because we have here a narrator who's obviously, you know, this Nick Carraway has some advantages, okay? We'll find out, you know, soon that he went to Yale. And so you don't, you know, don't throw stones. Don't don't criticize people because they haven't had the advantages that you've had. How about if people had so much more advantage, then can you criticize them? All right, so keep that in mind because Nick Carraway will be meeting a cast of crazy characters who are, uh, as you'll see, like crazy, all right? And just immoral, all right? And he's establishing, he, he said, my dad didn't say too much more about this. We were always uh, unusually communicative in a reserved way. Notice Gatsby, oh, Gatsby. Fitzgerald loves writing these oxymorons. Okay, so how can you be communi- uh, How can you communicate but be reserved? All right. And he says, "I'm inclined to reserve all judgments." That's interesting and perhaps not true, because this whole novel is a series of judgments. All right, that he's making about these characters and what really Fitzgerald is making about these characters in 1922. Fitzgerald, the writer, is sort of, not sort of, he is definitely channeling Nick Carraway here. Because Nick Carraway will have a foot in the party world, in the crazy world, but also he has a foot in the real world or the world of Like, this is the way things should be. And I can't tell a story if I'm drunk all the time. So, just like Fitzgerald, he was the king of the jazz age, as we'll find out. But he was also sometimes, you know, for long periods of time, stone cold sober. Because he's criticizing the very world that he has helped create, you know, so... So, so Nick Carraway needs to be this, this college-educated literary guy. Um, he says at the uh, towards the end of page one, I've been accused of a politician because I'm a, such a good listener, and people would tell me secrets of these wild unknown men. We're going to get to Gatsby. He's going to be one one of these wild unknown men. Thomas Buchanan will also be one of these wild unknown men. Even Meyer Wolfsheim might be. Even Allied Man 
all these crazy people, crazy cats, will talk to Nick because Nick is a dude who listens and he seems like you're, he's going to keep your confidence. Right? And then he uses another oxymoron, hostile levity. All right? Levity means fun, right? Uh, you know, think about levitate to, to rise up, to like move off the ground. But this, this hostile levity, so watch out for the oxymorons. They're fascinating. He uses them consistently. All right? And this idea of that quivering on the horizon, all right? This intimate revelation, right? That he's, I realized by some unmistakable sign of an intimate revelation was quivering. I mean, look at that word quiver. I mean, when you read The Great Gatsby, be aware that you're reading prose, but he's so influenced by Keats and the Romantics that the reading turns almost into verse. It turns into poetry. All right, let's move to the next page. All right, so he says, reserving judgments, I'm right here, is a matter of infinite hope. I use that line frequently. Like, Mr. Brown, don't judge me. Please don't judge me. And I say, reserving judgments is a matter of infinite hope, right? I believe in you. I'm not, yeah, you might have failed today. You might have failed tomorrow. You might, you know, not, you know, whatever. But I have infinite hope that things will work out, All right? And then he repeats this word, you know, snobbishly. You know, my father, uh, my father snobbishly suggested, and I snobbishly repeat that the sense of fundamental decencies is parceled out unequally at birth because it's not fair. Some people are just born, you know, <laughs> some people are born great, some people are born into greatness, and you know, to quote. Uh, Malvolio from Shakespeare, but it's just, you know, when you meet the Wilsons and don't be, don't be snobby to the Wilsons. There's just, you know, at birth, some people, some people get it. Some people don't get the gift. So just, and this is a snobby idea actually. Okay. So, but Fitzgerald is creating these few pages here of background because we need to know who our narrator is. We know we need to know who Nick Carraway is. All right. So we learn that he came east last autumn. I wanted to feel the world to be in uniform. Um, this is interesting because he uses that word uniform because he was in uniform. He fought in World War One, which I'll be talking about. And I wanted moral attention. I wanted like the world was crazy. I fought in World War One. I. I wanted to get back to some morality. The irony is this is the, the exact this is the exact thing he will not find in the crazy neighbor um, and all the craziness on East Egg. All right. Um, and then he uh, I says I didn't want any more riotous excursions with privileged glimpses into the human heart. But guess what? He's going to get that. He's going to get a riotous excursion with a privileged glimpse into the human heart. That human heart will be the great Gatsby. All right. Um, and he says, when I came back from the East last autumn, I felt like, you know, but now after, because what he's doing is he's telling us that this has all happened. The story of Gatsby has all happened and I don't want any more of it, right? So he says, only Gatsby, the man who gives his name to this book, which was not the original name of the great Gatsby. It was actually, there were several names, even like Fitzgerald didn't even like the name, the great Gatsby. Gatsby, who represented everything for which I have an unaffected scorn, All right, There's another oxymoron. So he scorns Gatsby. He says, only Gatsby is exempted from my reaction, even though I disapproved of him, All right? And scorn is a little bit more than disapprove. And then he says, if personality is an unbroken series of successful gestures, there is something gorgeous about him, some heightened sensitivity to the promises of life, as if he were related to one of those intricate machines that register earthquakes 10,000 miles away. Beautiful sentence, a long sentence. He uses a metaphor of like the Richter machine that can sense um, an earthquake and it like registers. Says, this is how sensitive 
Gatsby was, this sensitivity. He might be doing some bad things, but there was something gorgeous about him. These successful gestures, you know, like one thing after another, that he was after something greater than what everyone else in the novel was after, which was just sex, booze, and a good time, and money, okay? And he says he had this creative temperament. He had an extraordinary gift for hope and a romantic readiness such as I have never found in any other person, okay? And I'll never find it again, All right? So he's critical of Gatsby, but there's this other side of Gatsby, this romantic side, which we'll be talking about, especially with the colors blue and yellow. And he says, no, M dash, Gatsby turned all right at the end. All right, hmm, that's interesting. He's giving us a clue to the end of the novel. It is what preyed on Gatsby. Well, what preyed on Gatsby, all right? We'll be talking about that. What foul dust floated in the wake of his dreams. Okay, water imagery appears on every page of The Great Gatsby. It's, it's fascinating, all right? Wake here has several interpretations. Wake meaning to awake. Awake meaning a boat when it goes through the water creates a wake, right? Um, awake is also a funeral, right? So Fitzgerald uses and authors use words strategically for various dimensions, right? This foul dust that floated, notice the beautiful alliteration. We will get this dust in chapter two with the Valley of Ash, right? And then this, this, this foul dust temperately closes out Nick's interest in the abortive sorrows and short-winded elations of men. That he says, most people will go after things, but they just don't have, they don't have it in them. They just, it's short, it, it's short-winded. Like you can do a hundred, you know, a hundred yard dash, but you're not going the distance. Gatsby went the distance and he went all the way. Just like that great song by Cake, going the distance, right? Right, then he, then he leaves Gatsby, and then he talks about his family. My family have been prominent, well-to-do people from the Midwest. Every character from The Great Gatsby is from the Middle West. They all moved east because that's where things were happening. The Great White Way, New York City, electricity, Wall Street, bonds, stock market, you know, Harlem Renaissance. It's like it, a jazz, and that's where you can get good booze. Okay, so... He has a bit of like aristocracy here that we're descended from the Dukes of Laclue, right? And my grandfather was so rich, he sent a substitute to the Civil War. If you had money and you didn't want to fight in the Civil War, you could, you know, pay someone to fight for you. And there were enough poor people who would, you know, say, I'll take your money and fight, maybe die, but it's better than not having any money and dying anyway. So. Um, he said, I graduated from New Haven in 1915. Uh, it's pretentious to say that you go to Yale. Um, it's like one of those code words. It's like Harvard, like I'm going back to Cambridge or where do you, where do you go to school? Oh, Cambridge. Like I go to school in Cambridge, but it's, it's obnoxious or snobby to say I go to Harvard or Yale. So he graduated from New Haven in 1915, a century after his father. And then he says, I, I participated in the great delayed Teutonic migration, right? Uh, that's Teutonic is a, is a, is a synonym for funny for German, All right? The, the Teutonic migration, like the Germans were invading and okay, but it's funny to say the Teutonic migration, like the Germans were uh, migrating to other countries like Belgium and France and, and, Ru and Russia, blah, 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 known as the Great War. He says, I enjoyed the counter read so thoroughly, I came back restless. He says, you know, yeah, I came back from war. I didn't want to live in the Middle West. That seems so boring, you know, being out there in Minnesota. So I wanted, I wanted to be on the edge of the universe, which is New York City, and to learn the bond business, because if you wanted to make money, you went into Wall Street. He says, everybody I knew was in the bond business. And so he came east 
in the spring of 1922. So this whole novel takes place in the spring, but really it's the whole summer of 1922 when things were just kicking into gear, right? The world had been through a war, death, destruction, and suddenly now it wanted to change. It wanted to, you know, swing back. There was no more dying for God, king and country. Now it was about, let's have fun, let's rip it up. Uh, to use your lingo, it's YOLO, right? YOLO. So he's, he's in New York. He wants to like find a place and he couldn't find any rooms in the city. The practical thing was to find room in the city, but he's, you know, Okay, I can find a bad, I can find a you know cheaper place on Long Island. New York City's expensive, and he finds this weather-beaten bungalow at 80 a month. And at the last minute, ordered him to Washington. I found a gun. So he has this dog. Which we don't really see too much. And he talks about. Let me go back. He has uh, a woman. This Finn, he calls, who's his, like, maid, right? So he's, he's rich enough to have a maid who does, like, the cooking and cleaning and stuff. And he wants to go to, uh, how do you get to West Egg Village? So we have the East Egg and the West Egg. West Egg is where the Nouveau Riche, the new rich live, versus East Egg, which is the old wealth. To understand this, West Egg would be like the Voorhees of South Jersey, East Egg would be like the Haddonfield or the Morse Towns, right? The the older established money that's been in families for a long, long time. Okay. So he says, I was like this guide, this pathfinder, an original settler. And so he's setting up this whole idea, uh, Fitzgerald, of what this Nick Carraway is like. And he spends his time here studying the bond market. Right, Midas, Morgan, Mycenas, these are all people in, uh, famous for, you know, Midas could turn things into gold with his touch. Um, Morgan, of course, you know, Morgan, uh, the Robin Bearer of the uh, late 19th century, JP Morgan, and he's reading dozens of volumes on banking and credit and investment securities, and they stood out uh, like gold of new money because the 1920s was all about quick and easy money, right? And here he comes again to another paradox. I was going to go back to such things in life and become that limited of all specialists. Okay, how can you be a, you know, a well-rounded man? How can a well-rounded man be limited? All right, so, and he says, this isn't just an epigram, all right? Like a, an aphorism or a proverb life is much more successfully looked at from a single window after all which is a bit it which is a paradox all right my single window um was going to be this pursuit and of course the single window will also be um the story of the great gatsby all right and he's living in west egg uh, right on the sound, Long Island Sound. Uh, it's Long Island. I'll show you some maps where we have Long Island uh, right across um, the bay there. We have Connecticut. And he calls it the Great Wet Barnyard of Long Island. This is where the super rich, it's called the Gold Coast today, where all the millionaires have their mansions close to New York City. But this would be like their summer homes or they, they would have places in New York. Um, and he says, I lived at West Egg, the less fashionable of the two. That doesn't mean it's like shabby. It just means it's less fashionable. And he lives with, he lives next to people who just have these huge mansions, like some Hotel de Ville in Normandy and it's Gatsby's mansion. So he lives next to this guy who has this huge mansion. He has no idea who this Gatsby is, right? He, he, you know, he's just... We, he's just introducing Gatsby because we really actually won't meet him the third chapter. All right. And he's saying, okay, I'm here. There's these white palaces of fashionable East Egg glittering along the water. Notice these great verbs that he uses. 
quivering and glittering and it's like the glitter of the 1920s flash and you know it's so notice the verbs that he uses it's it's really amazing daisy's his second cousin he knew tom at yale people did not like tom they thought they, they hated his guts but he's a big brute of a guy and daisy's his second cousin once removed so they're family but not necessarily you know first cousins or you know um and he saw them in chicago and so the second part of chapter one is nick going to visit the buchanan's in east egg okay so hopefully this has helped you understand that nick caraway is a decent guy a moral guy a little superior he's educated he wrote in a literary journal or a magazine so he's a literary guy um and he's giving us background in order to establish his credibility as a narrator okay all right everyone thank you so much for listening